architectures? Are we still where we were 10 years ago? Um, how are automation and orchestration of QoS, uh, are be, how, how are those being addressed these days? <clears throat> these are uh, like they're, uh, they're lining up glueware here, huh? We should have saved uh, yeah. <laughs> hour from now. So yeah, yeah. There's there's a few comments here. Are are we still where we were 10 years ago? So when I wrote the computer networking problems and solutions books with Russ, meaning well, Russ wrote most of it, and I contributed some chapters. One of the chapters that I contributed was on QoS, and and sadly, as you look at the state of the art of that, for the most part, particularly when you're talking about enterprise QoS, things have not changed overly much. Most of the techniques are still there, are still valid using things like low latency queuing, uh, class-based weighted fair queuing, uh, reliance upon the toss byte and population of the DSCP value um, for marking traffic. That's all the same, none of that's really changed. Now there are some emerging techniques like uh, BBR, uh, there's some emerging algorithms like uh, CODL, um, uh, uh, controlled uh, delay, that's wrong. Um, anyway, but CODL, so that, that rethink how you're doing QoS, but generally speaking for the enterprise and the tools that are available to us, that's, it's, there are some advancements, but the core tooling is still there and still the way we do things. now. As far as automation and orchestration of QoS, right, Jeremy, um, you, you teed that up nicely. There are some vendors like Glueware who we're going to hear from in a bit, and actually that's one of the problems that we're going to talk about uh, is multi-vendor QoS and how to automate that. Um, there are some vendors that, that understand that language where you can build a QoS policy, what you want it to look like, and then deploy that um, across you know, multiple vendors. Now. Uh, SD-WAN kind of helps with this as well, where you would write a, a more of a business level policy that says, I need traffic of this class, like voice, to be treated in this way, um, low jitter, low latency, uh, no loss, and send that traffic down this line, um, or a, the line that matches that policy that I've written, and that's really done in an automated way, so it's less about I mean, because with with lines you don't own, like an SD WAN, you can't control the queuing policy because you don't. You just all you can do is send the traffic down a line that matches the behavior you're looking for to make sure your traffic gets delivered, and that's all done in an automated way. You write the policy, and the engine figures out which line is going to help you push the traffic in such a way to meet the SLA uh, for that policy. So there are advancements there. There's other um, automation uh, tooling vendors that are in that space that can help you with some of that. And of course, Cisco's had you know early flavors of this out at the edge, like Auto QoS that you can run on a switch and things, which I think is you're still typing something in at a CLI to make it happen, but still uh, it is a, a early and limited way to do some automation that's that's around that uh, different vendors will give you. Um, I'm also thinking about this in the context of edge uh, QoS, not really data center QoS, which isn't something I believe in. Uh, I'm a fan of, you know, bandwidth is the answer to that problem. You know, don't try to run QoS in your core because you did something wrong if that's the problem you have, mm -hmm. generally speaking. Uh, I've been talking a long time now. Anybody else want to comment? I, I would say that I, I agree with you. The, the underlying nuts and bolts of it, um, um, how, we're, how we're applying QoS, is largely the same. Um, it's really just a matter of how that gets deployed to the to the network with with these tools, whether they're whether they're uh, other vendors or or things that people have custom made to to script out things or or like you said using AutoQS. Uh, but uh, under the covers, the how we how it, how it um, applies to the traffic is still largely the same. Mm -hmm. It just um, the two two quick thoughts. One, I, I kind of push back on you on the uh, on the no QoS in the data center um, because I always worry about that worst case scenario. What happens yeah. if certain links fail? And that you know seems like a massive 40 gig link, but if it's saturated, there's some traffic that's more important to me than others. Um, so I also oh, the scenario of um, we're in a failure state and now we need yeah, yeah you're oversubscribed under failure. Uh, you run degraded in a failure condition, yeah. But, but if you're going to run degraded, you want to run degraded in the way you want to run degraded. You know, I well, still want ask, voice to work. Yeah, it would, yeah. Uh, I wouldn't, but anyway. John, let me ask you a question. <laughs> I still if you're want my voice... money to get through, Jeremy. <laughs> That's what I want. <laughs> so, John, you're a voice person. 
if you're running over a 10 gig link, does voice actually need QOS at that speed? Because once you get to 10 gigs, you've still got very high interleaving and very low latency. So even if a few packets drop, it's not going to be a huge issue. Well, um, so I, you know what they say, you can always throw bandwidth at it, but there's always going to be that case where something could potentially flood that link and you're going to need the QoS. So I would say even if you've got a 10 gig link, if you're running voice over that link, um, you still probably want to have it there. And, and you want it to go out to the end, which is not necessarily going to be 10 gig down to the phone or the gateway level. So um, in order to pass that all the way through, you, you do want it to be on that 10 gig link. Yeah, my, my my point of view is, what does it cost you to put that policy there? You know, practically yeah. nothing. And the one time it saves you, it was worth all the effort. Well, that's it. Does it only cost you nothing if you've got people who can configure costs? Well, fair. And enough. you know the device. <laughs> and, and the vendors push it out. And push it, it, out, in a, yeah, push it and, out in a push it out in a consistent and, way. Yeah. And and pushing it out in a consistent way is where yeah. I find people fall down. If you've got a multi-vendor network configuring, yeah, and you've got, say, more than four or five devices in the path, you're effectively never going to get a cost strategy working reliably, in my experience. Because uh, every line even, card, every version of the code, every release, every hardware, every, you know, everyone does their cost differently, and it's, there's effectively zero ways to test it and validate it. Well, but I mean, that, that's our job, right? To do that. <laughs> I, so. That's why we get the big bucks. It, it is. All right, I want <laughs> just, just one last thought on that question. Yeah. And it has almost nothing to do with the question, but the biggest difference I've seen in the last 10 years in QoS is applications. Uh, applications are hungry now. Um, almost every application of size, you know, FTP used to be kind of a, a well-behaving application. Uh, NetApp replication, which is sort of the same thing, is not, right? It will take all the bandwidth it could possibly take. So um, that's the biggest difference I've seen in 10 years in QoS. Flavio says here, successful cost strategies by web scale companies is highly dependent on host configuration. What he's making a very good point there is that most big companies are solving this by fiddling with the TCP stack in the end nodes. And he's right. Again, yeah. the network can't yeah. fix what is fundamental. You know, IP telephony um, systems obviously often have very, very poor TCP or UDP stacks, and they fail to do things right. And at the end of the day, you may find that sometimes no matter what cost you do, you can't fix it because the maker of the telephone system is abysmally poor. Mm -hmm.